Rosie Williams' baptism immediately following service today. She has a lot of friends here, and I'll try not to encourage you. Where you go? I don't know, too, but you know, I'll be good. Uh, so come join us after that if you don't have anything going on. Uh, Monday, 28th, Pearls are meeting at 6. Uh, come join us on Wednesday for fellowship at 6. Bible studies at 645. You can be meeting in the basement at 645. Uh, my number's here in the bulletin if you need anything. Uh, September 2nd is used car wash. Uh, that is one more fire department between 10 and 12. Uh, get with Travis if you've got a kid if you want to bring out there. Um, got a bunch of birthdays this month. Happy birthday, everybody. Uh, Paul Hill's arrangements. Visitation will be 1 to 7 uh, today and 9 to 10 tomorrow at J.C. Curry. Uh, funeral at 10 a.m. Richie? <laughs> there will be a surprise 80th birthday party from 2 to 4 for Bobby Gray Pearson in Ruth Kirby Hall. Dave? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, some of you guys have already turned this in after last week, but if you haven't, please make sure you take a moment to fill this out. Uh, it should be in your bulletin. If you don't have one, we can get you one. But this is for the new online church directory. If you weren't here last week, then you didn't hear me talk about it. But uh, we're going to do a new directory, but it's all going to be online and digital, so you can access it and update it anytime you want, rather than having uh, an old you know, photo one that goes outdated within a couple years. Um, but this is what's important. In order for you to be able to get access to that and, and, and update it when you need to or update a picture on your family, uh, in order to do that, you first have to give us the information and we have to put you in it. Uh, and specifically, we need uh, somebody's email, somebody's email in the family because that's how you will log on. Uh, but once you're in, uh, we're going to do this for probably another week at least. Uh, and then everything should go online. And once you're in, uh, we'll give you all that information of how to go on and access it or how to download the app. You can actually be in church looking people up, you know. Uh, once we have that going and up and ready, you'll be able to access it straight from there into your email and go in and change information, put a new picture, you put a new picture every month, you know. Um, but anyway, so please make sure you do that. You can either drop it in the offering plate, one of the boxes on next to the doors, or there's even a basket out there. So there's lots of ways for you guys to turn this in when you're done with it. Um, but please, don't fill it out during the sermon. I know some of you. Let me know if you need to Anybody have any prayer requests? don't know it, but Tanika and Darren won. Uh, Tanika's mom passed away this week, and they're going to have her at the uh, Holmes Funeral Home today from 1 to 2 and then the service at 2 o'clock today, so uh, I wanted to announce that. Big prayer for their family. Anybody else? Thank you.
first second, we'll add stand to the 20. My name is Danny Pace. I'm the pastor here. For those of you who might not know who I am, whether you are here in person or you're watching online, we're super blessed to have you. Thank you so much for being here, especially if you are a guest. I know we have a few, so uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. You are a blessing, and so we just ask for you to make yourself at home. Thank you guys for choosing to worship with us today. Everybody grab your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 48. Can you believe it? 48. This is week 26 of our Genesis series, but I'm telling you, after today, we only have one more, one more. Some of you guys have absolutely loved our study of Genesis. Some of you probably are eager for it to be over, and that's fine. I understand it's been a long haul, 26 weeks so far. Genesis is a, has all been about beginnings. It's a series of beginnings because that is Genesis itself is a book of beginnings. I've said this repeatedly throughout the whole series. It's the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the world, of mankind, of nations. But most importantly, it tells the birth and the beginnings of our faith. 
this week's message. I'm just simply entitling Legacy. Legacy. We're drawing to the end of Joseph's story specifically. Joseph, he's who we've been talking about for the last several weeks. He's had a, a difficult life filled with obstacles and hardships. But as we've discovered over the last few weeks, Joseph's life has been one that has been ordained by God. Everything that he has endured has been a part of God's ultimate plan to save Joseph's family family, to keep the covenantal promises that he's made to Joseph's forefathers, and to create a chosen set-apart people for himself. As we noted in the last message, repentance, forgiveness, grace, salvation, those are the themes that mark Joseph's life, and they mark ours as well. But before we get into today's passage, or before we do a recap, rather, let's jump into today's passage. Genesis 48, I didn't tell you the verses because we're reading it all. <laughs> I know, I know, you guys love it when I do that. I know it. Here we go. Beginning with verse 1. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. And when Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples and I will give this land to you as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours. In the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning from Adon, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? It's unclear now if this is, if this is uh, Jacob who has not yet met them for the first time, maybe seeing them, or if it's his eyesight. But he doesn't quite, he can't picture who they are. So he says, who are these? Verse 9, they are the sons that God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. And then Israel said, bring them to me so that I might bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him and his father kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again. And now God has allowed me to see your children too. And then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand, and he brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and he said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name in the names of my father Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, no, 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 my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son. I know that he too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God like you, like Ephraim and Manasseh, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. And then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, I give one more ridge of land than to your brothers, the ridge I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow chapter 48. The first 
28 verses, nearly half of the following chapter, chapter 29 or 49, continues to tell of Jacob's final words of blessings to his sons and his heirs. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it <laughs> unless, unless you want me to. You, you want, we can. Um, what's the point of all of those verses, the ones we've read and those additional 28? What is the point? Why? It's there because we are meant to see the great intentionality that was placed on blessing that future generation. We should feel the importance of it. We should feel the weight of it. Jacob literally took his final days on earth to impart blessing on them. But most importantly... As he did during his life, he imparted his faith to them. Trust and obey, he shared. Trust and obey. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house, Lord. I thank you for those that you have brought into this fellowship this morning, God. I do not believe it is by accident. I believe that you have ordained our steps, Lord, and that you have brought those who need to hear this message and those perhaps who will be tuning into it later, Lord. You have brought them for this moment. And so, God, I ask for you to speak and be faithful. Holy Spirit, encourage, equip, challenge, and convict, Father. Lord, we ask for you to speak. Father, we thank you for this word, God, and we thank you for this challenge that it reminds us it reminds us of how we should live, that our lives are a walking testimony of our faith. That the words we speak are a walking, breathing testimony of our faith, Lord. That our actions matter. Father, and it reminds us of the great importance we have to share that faith with those coming behind us. Father God, may that be something that we wrestle with this week as we leave here and we go back into our days Father, may we wrestle with it. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you recall, Jacob and his entire clan has come to live in Egypt after Joseph had saved them from famine. It was a glorious reunion. I mean, Joseph and his brothers were reconciled. A father had his son back. And God reminds Jacob of the covenant that he has made with him and his father and his grandfather. It was all there in Genesis 46. You don't have to flip back to it. But it said, and God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there, and I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. Back again as in back to the promised land. God has blessed Joseph. God is continuing to bless Jacob. And even Pharaoh has felt the overflow of God's blessing on this family. The covenant was felt by everyone that it was involved with, everyone surrounding the covenant. Just like we read of the stories of Abraham and Isaac back at the beginning of Genesis, God has been faithful to this group of people, so incredibly faithful. In fact, Jacob begins his blessing of his heirs by reliving this encounter that he had with God in the wilderness, the day that God spoke to him in Canaan. It was right there in verses 3 and 5 of 48. If you still have it, you can read it with me. It says, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples. That's AKA nations. And I will give you this land to you as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. And this is where things get interesting. <laughs> 
they get really interesting. Maybe you picked up on it, and, and maybe you were just as confused as I was the first time that I read through this passage of Scripture. Because, it, because immediately after Jacob reiterates God's promise to him, he seems to just kind of like up and take Joseph's kids away. Did you notice that? He's like, oh, these are mine now. That's what he says. It sounds like that's what's happening. What am I talking about? Look at it again. Maybe you skipped it. Verses 5 and 6, he says, Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt, before I came to you here, will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them, well, they'll be yours. What in the world is going on? This seems so crazy. And we've read some crazy stuff in Genesis, but you guys are like, well, this is really crazy, right? It turns out it's not nearly as weird as it sounds at all. So you have to remember, Jacob hadn't met either of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, until he had arrived in Egypt. Joseph himself was thought to be dead, remember? He doesn't even know Joseph's alive. And so now, here Jacob is in Egypt, and he is being introduced to Joseph's wife and to the children. That's right, Joseph's family. We skipped over that. Some of you guys are like, when did he get married? Well, this is when it happened. Uh, when he was made second in command of all of Egypt, Pharaoh also said oh yeah and here's a wife you should have one I'm not making it up go back and look at it back to the adoption because that is what Jacob is applying here he's telling Joseph that his two sons are to be treated as his own meaning that Jacob plans to recognize them as his own sons, his own flesh and blood, and he will leave them an inheritance as if they were his. Any children that Joseph has afterward, Joseph, that will be your responsibility. But these two, they will be heirs of Jacob. Now, we're not 100% sure why Jacob did this. There are some theories. Some scholars believe that Jacob is actually punishing Simeon and Reuben. Because if you go and you read chapter 49, those boys got up to some pretty wicked things, apparently. And he's not happy with them at all. So some scholars think he's replacing them. It's a form of punishment. Or maybe, maybe Jacob did it to honor Rachel because he brings up the fact that Rachel died once again in childbirth after she'd only had two sons. And so maybe, maybe it's to honor her because she wasn't able to have any more sons. So he's taken on these two kind of in her name. We're not sure. One thing we do know is that Jacob had a reason and that Joseph's sons would now receive a full birthright and inheritance from Grandpa Jacob. Actually, we are told, if you read closely, a double portion. But even more, it means that these two boys are now heirs of God's covenant. And as we saw in Jacob's own story, the primary blessing was going to be passed down to the youngest, Ephraim. It's right there in chapter 48, 13 and 14, if you look. It gets kind of, it gets kind of heady because there's a lot of things going on and people getting moved around. And, uh, but it says in verse 13, And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. So stop right there. So Joseph has the two boys with him, and he takes them, and he positions them and maneuvers them so that the oldest will be at Jacob's right hand side. We'll get to that in just a minute. But he's done this, done this intentionally because he knows the blessing is coming. 14, but Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. 
So Jacob's eyesight is so bad that he can barely make out which kid is which, right? And, and so he asks Joseph to tell him. And when he does, he, he kind of positions himself so he knows which one he's looking at. Now remember, Jacob is the one who several weeks back actually stole his brother Esau's blessing because his own father couldn't see. You remember that? He's learned. So blind Jacob wants to make sure he doesn't make the wrong, the same mistake. But it isn't the oldest son that Jacob is trying to keep track of. It's the youngest. How do we know this? Because when he blesses them, Jacob crosses his arms. Wow. Why does that matter? Some of you guys are like, I don't get it. You're doing one of those preacher's things where it's like, I'm supposed to, it's supposed to mean something to me and I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about, right? So you have to understand that every cultural custom and legal proceeding of this period would have dictated that the older brother receive the greater blessing. And this idea was indicated by the right hand of blessing as if to symbolize that the one who sits on my right hand or at my right side is my primary heir. We've talked about this before. It meant that, the, that this person would receive the lion's share of the inheritance, yes. However, it also declared them to be the leader of the family clan as well. They were responsible for the whole kit and caboodle. All leadership, all rights, all privileges, all decisions that would impact the entire family were to go through and pass on to the one who received the right hand of blessing as Jacob begins to bless the two boys Joseph notices this discrepancy and he tries to make it right he says father you got your hands on the wrong kids <laughs> Jacob denies him Jacob says no I don't he knows exactly what he's doing the youngest would be the chief heir. Verses 18 and 19, Joseph said to him, no, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son. I know. He too will become a great people and he too will become a great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. And with that, Ephraim receives the greater blessing and the tribe of Ephraim would go on to become the leading tribe among the 12 tribes of Israel. Ephraim's descendants would become what was later known as Israel's northern kingdom. So vast and so huge that oftentimes Israel is referred to as Ephraim in the Old Testament. That's how influential that tribe became. But why is any of that important to us? What's the point? The point I would like to make today is that it forces us to think about our own lives and to ask ourselves the question, what am I leaving behind? What am I leaving behind? I mean, like Jacob None of us will live forever. And each and every one of us is leaving a legacy. Passing down a message to future generations. Whether it's your own children or your grandchildren or your nieces or your nephews or the young people that God has placed around you and in your care. Brothers and sisters, you are influencing a future generation. We are forever leaving a legacy for better or for worse. And so you have to ask yourself, what legacy am I leaving? What are you passing on? Our time here is short, so short. And we have to pass the baton well. 
And usually when we think of leaving something behind, our our thoughts immediately go to physical things, a, a physical legacy, tangible things that we might leave to our sons and our daughters or those that we love and and we pass on our most prized possessions but Jacob's most prized possession was his faith it was his belief in his God in verses 15 and 16 he says may the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day the angel who has delivered me from all harm may he bless these boys In verse 21, he says, Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. How did he know this? Because God had already promised it to him. And then in chapter 49, picking up in the middle of verse 24, Jacob says, Because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and of the womb, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age old hills. Because of my God, he says, the blessings that have been poured out on me are greater than that of even the blessings of creation, of the formations of the mountains and the deep and the hills. Jacob's most valuable possession was his faith. And his words of wisdom in those final days was trust the Lord. Obey the Lord and he will deliver you as he has me. He will sustain you as he has me. He will bless you as he has me. You will be his and he will be yours. He is our salvation. Years later, the wise King Solomon would echo the same sentiments when he dwelt on the meaning of life. In Ecclesiastes, he he wraps everything up in this one sentiment. Now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. The essence of life There was nothing that Jacob wanted more than for his sons and his family to know God, to know his God. And that's really the point. Why did it matter to him? Why was it the most important thing? Why was this his valued possession? Because Jacob knew God intimately. And if I could be so bold, church... You can't pass on what you don't know. If you recall, it took Jacob most of his life to finally trust in his father's God as his own. It took a wrestling match, do you remember? But when he did, there was no turning back. And there was not a doubt in his mind about what was valuable and important. If you are a parent or a grandparent or a believer or just simply someone who has been entrusted with someone young, the next generation to come after you, you must ask yourself, what are you leaving behind? because you are leaving something as we stand and as we sing.